Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled COVID-19, Putting Together the Pieces of the Pandemic. This webinar is part of the ongoing coronavirus virtual webinar series. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, the presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Roshanak Hashimyon, a clinical, I'm sorry, a clinical scientist, author, and consultant. For a complete biography on Roshanak, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Rojanek, you can now begin your presentation. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction and uh, for the invitation to join this wonderful conference. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and thank you to the audience. I just want to um, <laughs> let you all know the uh, irony is not lost on me that I am giving you this presentation as I myself am recovering from coronavirus. So <clears throat> I hope you'll bear with me if um, my voice gets a little wobbly sometimes, but um, I, uh, I hope that's going to help me get a little more insight into answering the questions that we all seem to be having because really there's so much going on. There's so many moving parts to this uh, pandemic that we're facing. And so let's, uh, let's see if we can take it from the top and um, get through some of these, uh, get through some of these um, issues that we have and, and some of the practical questions and some of the more scientifically geared questions. This uh, talk is intended for a general audience. So I hope that uh, I can help you get through whatever confusion um, that you may have and provide some scientifically sound information. So, Let's take it from the top. Let's see how they, all these pieces fit together. And let's see how we got here and where here is. Okay, so how did we get here? <clears throat> I'm going to start to tell you the story of coronavirus. So coronavirus is a virus that's endemic to animals, including humans, and has been around for over a thousand years. It is Epidemiologically, um, the cause of over 10%, close to 15% of what we know as the common cold. And it's a community-acquired upper respiratory tract infection that we experience whenever we get coronavirus. So the coronaviruses are really a highly diverse family of viruses that are, are named coronavirus, actually, because of the um, the way that they appear under the microscope. They have uh, these proteins that stick out of them that are called spike proteins. And as you can see, they look like they have a little crown around the virus, and so the name corona. And coronaviruses are actually called CoV, taken from the first letters of the coronavirus and then the V for virus. There are, uh, as I said, a range of coronaviruses. There are viruses that are endemic to humans, and this is a human coronavirus. There are four that are pretty well known. <clears throat> uh, these human coronaviruses cause self-limiting upper respiratory tract infections. Uh, the first two that were discovered in the 1960s are the first two that I'm going to present, and they're important because they came before we were aware of these other coronaviruses with which we are all now dealing. So the first coronavirus is called H for human, CoV virus, 229E. And um, that one's found in humans and bats. It binds to the 
APN receptor, which is uh, an amino peptide ACE uh, N receptor. It causes respiratory symptoms like the common cold, but it can also um, cause um, more high morbidity outcomes like pneumonia or bronchiolitis, which is found in children under two. It comes under the, under the genus of alpha coronavirus and is really a community acquired transmission. It goes through respiratory droplets and fomites. Fomites are any inanimate object that when contaminated with or exposed to infectious agents, uh, such as you know, pathogenic bacteria or viruses or fungi, can transfer disease to a new host. In other words, like your tabletop, door handles, things like that, that might have a bug on it. The next coronavirus that we learned of in the 1960s is called HCOV OC43. This one is found in humans and cattle. It also causes respiratory symptoms, and both of these are um, really what we get when we get the common cold. But this one can also cause some severe lower respiratory tract infections, including pneumonia. And this binds to the N-acetyl-9-O-acetylneuraminic acid receptor, which is sometimes called 9-anana. <laughs> this is from the genus beta coronavirus, and um, uh, it expresses the HE, or hematoglutin esterase gene. The third human coronavirus was discovered in 2004, so it was many years later. Um, it is found uh, mostly uh, in children and immunocompromised uh, individuals. They're more susceptible to the uh, HCoV NL63. Um, typically, it does uh, trigger things like upper, mild upper respiratory symptoms, and people will have coughs, fever, rhinorrhea, which is basically runny nose. Um, again, what we see in a, a common cold, but they, uh, you can get more severe lower respiratory tract involvement like bronchiolitis, but in particular, and mainly in younger children, croup. There's a high frequency of croup attributed to this virus. Um, it was originally thought that this one binds to the ACE2 uh, protein receptor, but it turns out that the ACE2 protein receptor is actually required for the viral entry but it's not the primary binding site on the cell surface. Rather, it's heparin sulfates that serve as attachment receptors for the HCoV NL63. This, interestingly, is the etiological agent for up to 10% of all respiratory diseases. And its origin is in palm civets and bats, but has been in humans for centuries. The last coronavirus was discovered the following year in 2005, and it's similar to the others in the ways that I've already described. Uh, this one is also um, of the genus beta coronavirus and biles to the Ananana. <laughs> and, um, but it's phylogenetically distinct from the HCoV OC43 just above it. Um, I put those two um, vertically because they're both beta coronaviruses, and the two horizontal are the two that we've known up until 2002. This one is phylogenetically distinct and is more related to the mouse hepatitis virus. Now, even though there's really four uh, human coronaviruses that we know of, there's another one that is very, very, very rare, and I'm just going to throw it in here so you've, you will have heard about it, and it's the HCoV EMC, and that was found in 2013. There's only 10 known cases, and it was isolated from a few patients with respiratory and renal disease in the Middle East. It binds to the DPP4 receptor, and um, there's some thought that it's actually just a strain of the MERS-CoV. Uh, it confers a greater than 50% mortality rate. Uh, it originated from bats, but um, it's, um, differently than all the other um, viruses that we've discussed, uh, and, and pretty much coronaviruses at all, this can infect humans and bats, and also porcine cells. So this is really exceptional because coronaviruses show strict host specificity. Um, and also person-to-person -person transmission is uncommon, unlike the others. And uh, it is also the genus beta coronavirus. So, Coronaviruses are um, RNA viruses. Vi these viruses contain proteins, 
lipids, and nucleic acids. They characteristically disassemble after cell entry and then assemble their progeny during replication. These RNA viruses, they mutate fast. Um, that's a feature that helps them jump from species and evade both natural and medical efforts to kill them. Influenza, for instance, mutates so quickly that we need a new vaccine for it every year, for example. So, coronavirus is an RNA virus of the type that does mutate like this. It's known as an enveloped, positive sense, single strand RNA virus. Uh, coronaviruses in general have four structural proteins known as the S for spike. Uh, and you can see this uh, to the right of your slide. At the very top, it says S. So for S for spike, uh, there's the E for envelope, M for membrane, N for nucleocapsid proteins. Um, these are the four major proteins that these viruses have. Uh, the nucleocapsid protein holds the RNA genome. The S, E, and M proteins together create what's known as the viral envelope. Now, what did all that mean? <laughs> Let's break that all down, okay? You're going to be explaining this to me once we're done. So the first one that we'll talk about will be the M protein. Um, morphologically, these are the structural proteins. The M or the membrane protein or the viral matrix protein. This is the protein that's associated with the envelope. It's connecting the capsid to the viral glycoproteins inserted in the lipid bilayer. In other words, it's going across the lipid bilayer, the, that's, uh, the envelope that's protecting the RNA, and it's connecting or anchoring the inside of the virus, which is your RNA, which is your genetic material, to the rest of the uh, RNA, I'm sorry, to the rest of the virus. Um, the M protein actually is inserted in the lipid bilayer, as you can see, it's the green one, so I have it circled in green, uh, so you can understand more easily, and it, um, it interacts with the N protein during assembly, because the N protein uh, is what's covering the RNA. Uh, it organizes also into microdomains, it's not really random. So that's the M protein. The E, or the envelope protein, is a small integral membrane protein that's involved in several aspects of the virus's life cycle, such as assembly, budding, um, envelope formation, and pathogenesis. So it's really important in the critical aspects of the virus's life cycle. So a coronavirus lacking an E protein could make a promising vaccine candidate, for example. Sorry. There we go. So the spike protein, here we go. The S of the spike protein, which is this large protein that we see sticking out of these viruses, they have these um, sugars at the end. That's why it's called a glycoprotein. They're responsible for allowing the virus to attach to the membrane of a host cell. The glycoproteins on the surface of the envelope identify and bind to the receptor site on the host's membrane. They're also part of what gives the, the corona of the coronavirus. The viral envelope, uh, once it is, um, once the sp a spike protein connects to the host receptor, then the viral envelope can fuse with the host membrane, and that allows the capsid in the viral genome to enter and infect the host. Now, these beta um, coronaviruses, they also have, unlike some of the other um, RNA or other coronaviruses, the beta group, they have this hematagglutinin esterase, which is a glycoprotein that certain envelope viruses possess, and they use this as an invading mechanism. It assists, assists them to be able to get into host cells better. It helps with the attachment and the destruction of certain sialic acid receptors that are found in the host cell surface. So the viruses that possess these HEs they include the influenza C virus, the flu virus, and these beta coronaviruses. So after that, we see that um, those are the external, the, stru the structural proteins on the outside. Now going inside the cell, um, we see that there's this single-stranded RNA with the arrow of the same color pointing to it. And that RNA, you can't see it, but it's, 
If you look closely, you'll see there's another color running in there. That's really encapsulated by what's called the nucleocapsid or the N internal structural protein. This protects the RNA. It's a basic RNA binding protein, and it coats the RNA in this nucleocapsid. And that, the nucleocapsid, is what interacts with the M transmembrane protein during assembly that we talked about um, earlier on. So the lipid bilayer envelope. The lipid bilayer envelope is, um, sorry, I'm not going to talk about the lipid bilayer envelope right now. Uh, well, actually, sure, I will. So the lipid bilayer envelope is what you see in red. It's, it's the thing that all the proteins are connected or anchored to, and it's what protects the RNA on the inside. It derives uh, some of the host cell membrane in which both the viral glycoproteins and some of the host proteins are embedded. And it's relatively sensitive to desiccation, heat, detergents. So these viruses are easier to sterilize than non-enveloped viruses. So when we talked about um, coronavirus and these beta coronaviruses before, we said that they were um, enveloped viruses, and that's exactly the thing. Because they have the envelope, they're also very susceptible. Yeah, they can mutate fast, but um, things like alcohol that we use in our uh, hand sanitizer or soap, they will disrupt the envelope and therefore disrupt all the proteins that are connected to it that are necessary for the virus to connect to a host cell and therefore uh, be able to infect it. So uh, the virus can be inactivated by soap and alcohol and all these things which will destabilize its lipid bilayer. Now, inside the cell, we have the single-stranded RNA, which you see as the sort of manila-colored uh, helical thing. And that is called a single-stranded uh, positive sense RNA. And single-stranded positive sense viral RNA basically means that it's starting from the uh, five prime end. So it's going in the five prime to three prime direction. And this is a viral RNA that can act like messenger RNA because it can directly be translating the viral proteins uh, in the host cell. And that's why, all that stuff that I just told you, that's why we call this an envelope. Coronaviruses are called enveloped because you saw the envelope. The positive sense, because it's starting from the five prime, single-stranded, there's one strand of RNA, and that is designated with this plus SS, that's the positive sense single-strand RNA virus. So now you know what that means. It's not so hard. Um, now, these coronaviruses, they have a large genome, which uh, ranges from about 26, I'm sorry, 27 to 33 kb. And the coronavirus genome um, encodes for a 5' prime replicase polyprotein, the ORF1A and ORF1B. And that, in turn, encodes for all of the enzymes that are required for the viral replication. And that includes the, um, so you see on the left in the blue, those are the ORF1A and ORF1B that start from the five uh, prime sense will be leading to the um, encoding at the three prime uh, end for the structural proteins, the S, the E, the M, and the N proteins, the spike, envelope, membrane, and um, nucleocapsid proteins. Now, you know more about coronavirus than you ever wanted to know, right? Here comes the fun part. Now, coronaviruses are very interesting because they, oops, because they, they can do what's called a zoonotic jump. Viruses, these are, vi these are when viruses can transmit from animals to humans. So they can go, okay, viruses can go from animal to human or human to animal. But what's very interesting to us is when it comes from the animal to us. So while it's in the animal, the virus can go through a series of genetic mutations, and then that allows it to infect and multiply inside the human. Now, what does it need to be able to do that, to jump from the animal to the human uh, with this uh, genetic mutations? Well, it needs access and ability. 
it needs access because it needs to be able to reach the host cell, right? If it doesn't reach the host cell, it can't do anything. It needs ability because once it, once it reaches the host cell, the virus's protein has to recognize and it has to bind with the host cell at the receptor site. Once it can get to a host cell and once it can find a receptor that it can bind to, then it goes in. That's when we said the spike protein connects to the host cell, the receptor site, and then now the, the uh, virion can go inside the host cell and um, use the host cell machinery to rec replicate its um, genetic material and then start the cycle all over again, and that's the infection. Now, um, history. Cross-species transmission has led to the discovery of, of novel viruses in humans. In 2002, there was a discovery in China of an atypical uh, pneumonia, an unknown pathogen that was a zoonotic pathogen that was causing a severe respiratory disease in humans. This um, this cross-species transmission led to the discovery of a novel coronavirus known as the, well, let me back up for a second. In November of 2002, this uh, high, uh, I'm sorry, this new pneumonia caused a very high nosocomial transmission, which means that there was a lot of infection to the, you know, in through the hospital equipment and through the hospital staff. And it was determined to be caused by coronavirus that was found naturally in animals, but not in humans. That's why it was a zoonotic jump. And the zoonotic transmission was thought to occur through um, a civic cat, which had in turn gotten it from a bat. So if you look, you can see the bat on the left with the arrow with the virus uh, going towards the civet cat, but the civet cat can't give it back to the bat. However, it can give it to the human. So um, the research suggests that it came from the bat, but it needed a reservoir, which would be the civet cat, and the civet cat would be handled and consumed by humans, and that's how it would be transferred to us. So that means that um, although the ancestors of this uh, newly discovered um, coronavirus which is known as the um, SARS-CoV, um, that that required this reservoir where it could amplify. And the civet cat is that reservoir which allowed for a zo zoonotic transmission to occur. Now, I just want you to see what the civet cat looks like. It's really cute. Um, these animals end up getting smuggled into these live um, animal markets, also known as wet shops, and then they're sold for, you know, all kinds of things. And that's how we end up getting the viruses. Uh, this particular one was known to cause a severe acute respiratory syndrome. So the disease was called SARS. And then the virus, because it was from a coronavirus causing the severe acute respiratory syndrome, is so called SARS-CoV. So that happened in 2002. If you remember, we talked about the human coronaviruses. We didn't know about anything about coronaviruses as far as infecting humans from the 1960s until this one occurred in 2002. Well, then in 2012, uh, another new coronavirus outbreak was, uh, outbreak was reported. And this was first identified from a patient in Saudi Arabia, although it was later identified that the first known case came from a patient in Jordan in April of the same year. That disease was called Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and that virus, much like SARS, was um, called MERS-CoV because, because it caused the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Now, that one, um, although it was named for its effect um, on the respiratory system, also had an impact on the enteric system. So that means it caused a lot of GI issues like diarrhea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And while pneumonia and diarrhea were reported, some patients also remained asymptomatic. Now the VERS uh, coronavirus is a beta coronavirus that is also derived from bats. 
but they go through the dromedary camels. The dromedary camels are the reservoir for the MERS-CoV. The zoonotic transmission is quite efficient in MERS, even though uh, its person-to-person -person transmission is limited. So you've got the big, thick arrow going from the infected camels to the humans, but a much smaller anim uh, arrow going to other humans. Um, the transfer to other humans is typically through close contact, such as um, like with healthcare workers or with uh, family, close friends. And uh, the people who um, were infected with the MERS-CoV, they developed severe respiratory illness. Obviously, it's a Middle Eastern respiratory uh, syndrome. And um, they showed symptoms like uh, high fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Sound familiar? So... In 2019, in December, in Wuhan, China, there was again an atypical pneumonia that was discovered, and it was a new coronavirus or a novel coronavirus. So it got the designation 2019 N for novel coronavirus, CoV. And much like the original SARS, um, it was widely thought, and like MERS, it was widely thought to be uh, coming from bats. So, um, let's see, here we go. So, there was another zoonotic transmission, and along with other theories about whether or not it passed through another animal before infecting uh, humans, um, it was thought that, in fact, uh, it was going to um, come through a, a reservoir that is known as the pangolin. So the current thought is that it might that the there might be a natural uh, the this beta coronavirus might be a natural pangolin virus, or it may have jumped from another species in between capture and death, and then that that jumped to humans. So the bat could have given it to the pangolin, and the pangolin could have given it uh, to us. And just to see what the pangolin looks like, uh, and it's actually an endangered species, and um, these are also sold at the the wet shops or the live uh, animal markets. And the pangolin actually has these scales that you can see that uh, are bulletproof. Um, it really, uh, whenever you, that's the picture on the right, whenever they're caught, they um, immediately roll up and they try to protect themselves. And uh, that just makes them very easy for humans to just pick them up. And that's how they are caught and brought in either for their scales or for their meat. So. And that caused this uh, coronavirus 2019, it, it seems. So in January 30th of 2020, the World Health Organization declared the 2019-2020 coronavirus outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern, which is a very high designation. And then in February, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses they announced the name for the 2019 NCoV or the, the novel coronavirus as SARS-CoV-2 because of its uh, genetic similarity to the 2003 SARS-CoV virus, but they are not the same virus. Also on February 11th, the World Health Organization named the disease uh, COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019. Um, on March 11th, the COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, and it has affected nearly every corner of the earth. And um, you can see here now on this map that is uh, up to date to yesterday, it really has affected nearly every corner of the earth. It's in pretty much every country and region. Uh, these are all confirmed cases, which is really important because confirmed cases are an underestimate, actually, of all the cases that we have that are actually out there. So, um, let's see. Here we have a picture I uh, took of uh, what is the up-to-date, and now it's actually already increased, from the time that I 
tried to get this as up to date as possible for you just a, a couple of few hours ago till now. These numbers have actually increased. But as you can see, uh, there are close to a million people worldwide who have contracted the coronavirus and about 200,000 in the United States, uh, with Italy uh, behind at about half, in Spain and China. Um, and what's important is that you can see that there is this upward trajectory, this very strong increase, surge, in the number of people and the speed at which it is being transmitted. While other uh, countries, like, for example, South Korea, have really flattened the curve, as we've said, um, and are, are getting it under control. Now here, we can see the daily new, conf the daily new confirmed cases of COVID-19. So if you look at the bottom, you'll see uh, the number in the thousands that are being daily infected in what parts of the world. So if you look at the United States, it gives you a pretty scary picture of what's going on. Uh, Canada, uh, Brazil, and uh, parts of Europe, uh, Turkey and Iran are not far behind in the daily number of people that are getting infected. This is very important because people ask, you know, uh, are we really flattening the curve? What does that mean? You know, but in fact, yep, we sure are. It's, uh, it's kind of important to do. And here, just to show you a graphic of how quickly it's gone up from December of 2019 to April 1st, yesterday, worldwide, the daily new confirmed cases is very clearly on the rise. Unfortunately, with that comes also an increase in the total confirmed deaths. So here we have the map of the world again, and you can see uh, what areas of the world are really um, suffering pretty much uh, from this, uh, this coronavirus. The, the, it's not, you know, something a lot of people are like, oh, it's a hoax or it's not really happening. Well, these are the numbers and it really is happening and it really deserves our attention and our care. Um, how can we take care? How is this being transmitted so wildly like wildfire throughout the world? Well, um, the primary modes of transmission are through spray droplets, like from sneezing or coughing, and through direct contact with infected individuals. So contact with contaminated surfaces and objects that occurs primarily through people that are in close contact, uh, happens through these respiratory droplets that are from, like I said, the coughs or the sneezes, and those to the range of about one meter, and those are the heavy droplets. But uh, the virus itself can travel up to two meters or uh, a little over six feet. Uh, it's an airborne transmission that's uh, different from the drop transmission because it refers to the presence of the microbes within the droplet nuclei that are generally considered to be particles smaller than five micrometers in diameter. And, um, and so from the evaporation of the larger droplet or, or you know, when it's within a dust particle or whatever. And so they can remain in the air for a longer period of time. And they can be transmitted to others over these, uh, greater, you know, this greater distance, really double the distance meter. Uh, it's also very important to keep in mind that people can be pre-symptomatic or subclinical or asymptomatic individuals and still be contagious. So um, you also get this if you look down at the little hand in the bed. You can also get this from indirect contact uh, via contaminated surfaces. That's another possible uh, source for being able to get infected. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of talk about how long the viruses can stay in the air or stay on different objects. And uh, the most reliable source of information that we have for that was from a publication from the New England Journal of Medicine that evaluated the virus uh, persistence um, of the 19 virus, SCoV-2. And in that experiment, aerosols were generated in a three-jet collision nebulizer and then fed into a Goldberg drum. They were under controlled laboratory uh, 
emotions. That's a high power machine that does not reflect normal human cough conditions. Okay, it's really important to understand that. And the findings of the, the 19 people, uh, I'm sorry, the virus particles, aerosol particles um, lasting up to three hours doesn't reflect what's happening clinically, but actually um, happening experimentally. So this needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Nonetheless, I just wanted to report these findings for you. We've got the SARS virus and the SARS-CoV-2 in this. And red, you have the SARS, and blue, you have the SARS-CoV-2. And the numbers that you see are for the uh, ability and for the, that's the number on the left, and the numbers on the right are the half-life numbers. So in aerosol, on copper, those are the shortest. Cardboard, it's only a day. Uh, the half-life is important, so me would be would be three and a half hours. And like I said, that's in conditions, not normal conditions, then stainless steel, and it lasts the longest on uh, plastic. So how do we prevent this? Uh, first of all, the stuff you've been hearing a lot, nauseam, social distance, and the curve, and uh, wash your hands, and you know, cover your mouth, and use a tissue, cough into your elbow. Um, avoid other people, clean your surfaces, things like this. But don't forget, the really interesting and exciting part of this is how we can disrupt the envelope, the Achilles heel of the SARS-CoV-2, by using things like alcohol, because the presence of envelope confers an instability to the virus, and it makes it susceptible to things like detergents, soap, or lipid solvents, like alcohol. So you can clean these surface, surfaces with um, detergents, be very confident as long as the alcohol content is over 60 percent destroy the envelope and therefore are preventing the spread of 19. Now a bit of coronaviruses can confer respiratory diseases enteric hepatic and uh, neurological well, there's some debate about that one and um, what do symptoms look like when we get uh, these beta coronaviruses, or in particular for SARS-CoV-2, the, the virus for, uh, that we're now most concerned about. So the symptoms, if you look at the top, the most common symptoms are fever, dry cough, and fatigue. Um, and the common symptoms on the left, you've got headaches, nasal congestion, sore throat, uh, coughing up sputum, not to be confused with the dry cough. Um, shortness of breath and pain in the muscles or joints, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And then in the severe cases, you have the high fever, the coughing up of blood. Um, it's been found clinically that um, you, the patients have been observed early on to have syncope or fainting. Uh, they lose their appetites, not eating, dehydration, and persistent fevers. And I can tell you that's all really true because I just went through that. Um, there's, um, and I was wondering why, I mean, I was so dehydrated, I was drinking like a fish, but I was just dry all the time. Um, and this exertion hypoxia is no joke. I really didn't know if I could give the talk today because when I would even just eat or try to talk on the phone, because you know I'm in isolation for so long, um, I would get lightheaded. I, I would become hypoxic. I couldn't breathe right, and I'd start getting shortness of breath, and gasping for air. Um, the biggest concerns, and I, and I didn't, I didn't end up, I ended up avoiding the hospital actually at the very last minute when I was, people were coming to, to take me there because one of the things that's actually um, been observed about this uh, virus is that it goes in waves. So um, you can have this extreme shortness of breath, you're fainting, you can't move, which I experienced also. And then you're about to go to the hospital. It takes maybe 40 minutes to an hour or something maybe to get yourself sorted and whatever, to have your people come and take you or, or get an ambulance or whatever it is that's going on. By then you start to feel like you can breathe again. And since we're all trying to lighten the load, um, I right or wrong, and I don't know others have done this as well, um, then end up avoiding putting the strain on uh, healthcare workers and the hospital system. But for those who are, uh, the biggest concern for those who are not critically ill is this persistent painful cough. And it is really painful and really dry, I can tell you. 
So that is the really common non-critical uh, complaint. Um, a lot of people have this paroxysmal, I can never say this word, and especially now, paroxysmal, mm, sorry, dry, wheezy, coughing spasms, and then that in uh, turn precipitates desaturation. Um, I can tell you actually now that as I'm talking to you, I am already um, losing some oxygen. I'm already becoming mildly hypoxic, and I can feel the effects of it. So, deep breath for me. Um, this cough is not uh, addressed with cough syrups or like albuterol, um, codeine, uh, things like that seem to have very little effect on it. Um, okay, now let's look at the percentage of the population that is experiencing these uh, symptoms. So you can see that 99% of people end up with uh, fever and 70% with fatigue. 59% with a dry cough, et cetera. So those are the most common ones. And um, what's really important about this is that really about 81% of people end up having mild or no symptoms. So they won't even know that they have the virus or they'll feel like they have a cold or something's coming on and a couple of days later, they'll be fine. Um, about 15% of patients end up becoming severe with 5% being critical. In a report from a Chinese Center for uh, uh, Disease Control and Prevention, the Chinese CDC, that included uh, 44,000 and a half confirmed infections with an estimation uh, of the disease severity. In other words, they were able to really find out what was going on. Um, they, this is how they, they established this, these original numbers, but these numbers have been echoed. Um, from more patient populations across the world as it's been, you know, coming in. And 81%, uh, like I said, have the, the no or the mild pneumonia or, or symptoms. And then the ones who were severe that were uh, probably going to the hospital, they had the, the dyspnea, the hypoxia. Um, over 50% had a lung involvement. Um, that you could see on imaging within 24 to 48 hours, and then 5% are critical with uh, respiratory failure, shock, and uh, multi-organ dysfunction. So of that 5%, there's a 2.3% fatality. And of course, there's no death for those who are non-critical, right? Now, what's really important is that up to 30%, so of those mild cases, up to 30%, of these people can be what are called silent carriers. These are people who have tested positive for COVID-19, but who either show no symptoms or are showing delayed symptoms. And that's really important when we're talking about the spread of the virus. So, and keep that in mind because even though, okay, so pneumonia is a characteristic and it's uh, of this disease and it's characterized by fever, by a cough, by the dyspnea and um, uh, with bilateral infiltrates on chest imaging. Um, and the most frequent serious clinical manifestation of the infection is this pneumonia. And like we're saying, not everyone is symptomatic. Up to 30% of the mild cases are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, right? But even those who are asymptomatic can have these objective clinical abnormalities. That means they're going to end up, um, even though they seem to be okay, they're going to end up with this classic, what's called the ground glass opacity that's consistent with a viral pneumonia. Um, you can see this in up to 50% of the asymptomatic cases. So where those arrows are or where you see that what's called that ground glass opacity. And um, on the right, you can see uh, what the uh, chest CT abnormality should show. Normally, it would be a bilateral abnormality, which you see here. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, peripheral distribution. So typically you'll see on the peripheries and it will involve the lower lobes because it goes into the alveoli. That's where you get the ACE2 receptors that the um, coronavirus uh, connects to. Remember those spike proteins that want to find a receptor? Well, they find the ACE2 receptor and they connect there and those are in the alveoli which are found in the lower lobes of the lungs. 
And then, of course, you've got this typical ground glass opacities uh, or patchy uh, shadowing. And like I said, it can present in as much as 50% of asymptomatic uh, patients, which I find really just, wow. So take care of yourselves. Pay attention. Now, the symptom progression. Um, those who originally start with a mild symptoms can progress over the course of a week, you know, with this low inc um, incubation period. Normally, we're saying the incubation periods are one to 14 days, but they're usually about five or six. And then um, at around, um, uh, of course, somewhere in that five or six days or in that incubation period, you'll start to develop the mild symptoms if you're in that 81% category. But some people in that 15% category, after about five to eight days, can develop these severe symptoms. And, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm trying. Um, and in some study, and uh, like this one, they showed that uh, within five to eight days of the onset of symptoms for those who were very severe and also fell into the 5% category, they would go and get the hospital admission within um, five to eight days of uh, having like median, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, having their symptom onset. So what are the risk factors then? Oh, no. Before we go into the risk factors, let's look at this. Um, this is uh, what I was just explaining to you, um, but in a graphic form. But you can see that uh, there's a one to 14 day duration for the incubation period, but that the average says it's three to five days, but it's really about five days or six days. And during that time, you may or may not have symptoms. And then, um, well, I guess if it's incubation period, you don't have symptoms. And then uh, after whatever amount of time, when you start to show your mild symptoms, which is what we saw in that step ladder uh, graphic, um, you can start to have the fatigue, the fever, the, the dry cough, the sore throat, the runny nose. Um, and then the average time for that is about four to seven days. Um, severe symptoms can last up to six weeks or more. And I can attest to that. I've had this for weeks myself. Um, and especially those who are severe and uh, going to the hospital or who do end up in the hospital, uh, that can really last for a long time. They can be in the hospital for weeks on uh, with medical support. So the severe symptoms can uh, show up at about five or eight days is the median time, depending on what study you're looking at. That's after the onset of symptoms. And that shows itself as difficulty breathing. Or if it gets really bad, you know, that people get confused or they're not arousable, that's because they're not getting enough oxygen. Then, of course, the hospital admissions that can, you know, happen within a week. And uh, the return to normal activities, depending upon what's happening, hopefully within a week, uh, uh, you're back to, to being okay. Now, the risk factors. What are the risk factors? Well, um, it does affect, it's an equal opportunity uh, virus. It affects, uh, can infect men and women equally, but uh, in some cases we find that more men have died from the virus than women. Um, another risk factor, and I'll get back to that uh, in a second, another risk factor is age. So um, even though anyone can catch COVID-19 and uh, the illness is generally mild, especially for children and young adults, um, it can become serious uh, with about one in five people, like we said, 5% requiring hospital care. And in the studies of hospital patients with confirmed COVID-19, the median age range was 49 to 56 years. But you can see that the fatality rate starts to go up and actually double as we get higher up in um, the age groups. People who are uh, thought to be at higher risk, of course, then for more serious illness or mortality are the ones who are over 45, they get hospitalized, right? We saw that the median age was 49 to 56. And then the mortality is at 65. So if we compare this by country, we find that it's more or less even throughout 
uh, with some countries that are involved. Um, this is what you can look at. Um, and since you can come back and look at this talk at any time, you can freeze on this and look more closely. But uh, by and large, you can see that uh, all the countries are um, uh, almost identical in, in the, the uh, increase in mortality and the seriousness of the disease with age. Now, um, here is the share of the population that is 70 years of age or older. So this is the population breakdown as of 2015 of country and, and uh, who have an elderly population of you know, 70 or over, right? But if you compare countries like Italy and Germany, they have almost the same number of elderly in the population, although Italy's is a bit higher. And yet, when you look at the fatality rate, it's almost 12% fatality for Italy, while Germany has a fatality rate that's 10 times lower at about 1.2%. So age by itself is not conferring mortality. This is really, really important. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm too young. I'm, I'm not that old. I'm not going to get it. I'm going to be okay. It's, this is just for old people. Not true. There's a tenfold difference between Germany and Italy of almost the same number of older people in the population. Now, if you look at Germany compared to the U.S., the U.S. has far lower, a much younger population, right? Uh, and yet, again, when you compare Italy to Germany, um, you can see, I'm sorry, uh, the U.S. to Germany, you can see that the U.S., oh, you can't see the fatality rates here, but I can tell you that at, um, as, of, uh, as of the time of this, the fatality rates um, in Germany were about half of what they were in the U.S., and yet the U.S. has a much younger population. And in the last days, it's gotten much worse. That fatality rate has gone actually much, much higher. And instead of being at about 2.4%, has jumped to 5%. And we'll see uh, some of the reason for why that's been happening in a minute. One of the other, um, so there's two uh, categories of risk factors. One is age, the other is comorbidities. So, um, people who are immunocompromised or who have underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or lung disease, hypertension, they confer a higher fatality rate. Um, and this is just one example of it in a confirmed study that was done in China. Okay. Now, how do you manage this thing? So in all, the, the, the initial management focus of this is to look for what's going on early on. There has to be early recognition of what's happening. Um, in those countries that did start to act and did start to notice, for example, Taiwan, they um, started to flatten the curve immediately, and they did much better. Um, they also, if you also start to do immediate isolation so as to break down the transmission and, uh, and, of course, take infection control measures. Ooh, I see I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to rush through this. Sorry. So I'm going to quickly talk about some of the limited role of glucocorticoids. I'll show the slides so you can come back and look at them and freeze on them when you want. Um, there is an, um, for glucocorticoids, uh, the World Health Organization and the CDC recommend that uh, glucocorticoids not be used in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia unless there are other indications um, like exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or something. And the reason is um, that people wanted to use glucocorticoids is because in influenza, uh, I'm sorry, that they, they shouldn't be using glucocorticoids is because in influenza, it actually, which is another uh, bit of coronavirus, it increased the risk for mortality. Um, in MERS-CoV, it delayed the viral clearance. And also in SARS, there's no good evidence for the benefit, and there was persuasive evidence of adverse short-term and long-term harm. Um, also, there's a lot of question about whether or not we should be taking NSAIDs, um, ibuprofen, 
and uh, whether or not they have uh, a negative impact. There has been talks about the negative impact on the disease outcome, outcome but number one, it's been anecdotal because of uh, some um, um, clinicians that suggested that, that the NSAIDs early in the course of the disease may, um, uh, may have uh, caused a, a few young patients to uh, experience a more se severe disease just because of a correlation. They had no basis for causation. And also there was a theoretical concern that anti-inflammatory properties of the NSAIDs could have a negative impact on um, the, uh, in the uh, patient's immune response. There are other uh, investigational agents uh, that we can look at for management. There's a number of investigational agents that are being explored for antiviral treatments for uh, COVID-19 and enrollment in clinical trials uh, should be discussed with you know, patients or their proxies. And, but there's a registry of um, uh, international clinical trials that you can find at either the World Health Organization website or clinicaltrials.gov. Um, there are also several investigational agents that are being explored for antiviral treatments of COVID-19, as I said. Now, the most important of these that we should look at quickly is um, here, the uh, remdesivir has several trials underway. Um, sorry, let me just quickly go through this if I can. Um, it's been, uh, for several rand uh, randomized trials, they've um, Evaluate the efficacy for moderate or severe COVID-19. Um, this is a novel nucleotide analog that has activity against severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, what we have in vitro. And um, it's, here we go. And it's, uh, the, uh, it's been shown to be effective against uh, SARS also and uh, MERS-CoV um, in vitro and in animal models. So because of that, um, it's uh, really on everyone's radar. And there was a, there's a compassionate use of it uh, through an investigational new drug application that was uh, described in a case report um, of one of five patients in the US. So, but we don't, we don't know the clinical impacts of it. This, this is an unknown. Um, there are a few other investigational agents which I have listed here. Um, the use of chloroquinone has been included in the guidelines from China's National Health Commission and was reportedly associated with reduced progression of disease and decreased duration of symptoms, but primary data supporting these claims have not been published. Um, I think I'm running out of time here. So very quickly, um, these are the, some of the agents that are on our radar. Um, now let's look at comparative measures. There are some variables that we need to look at, which is the reproductive number, um, the case fatality rate, which is the number of deaths over the, divided by the number of uh, confirmed cases. So what we're calling the, the fatality rate or the number of people that are dying um, is really uh, going to change based on the number of confirmed cases. And the number of confirmed cases that we have is problematic because so many people are not getting tested, and that's the third thing. Um, they are, uh, there's a problem with the testing, they're not being tested, so there's talk of the actual number of cases being up to or more than four times the number of the confirmed cases. So that plus the health of the healthcare system are the variables that are really important for determining um, what's going on. So very quickly, just so you can see what the reproductive number is, it's just how many people are you going to give it to you if you have the virus. And the reproductive number, or the R0, for SARS-CoV-2 is about 2.2, according to models. And as you can see, you can very quickly multiply. And this is just to show you, as of March, how quickly that curve goes up. Now, just to give you a quick comparison, SARS, 8,000 people. 774 deaths, case fatality rate was 9.6%, and it hit 29 countries. It was found in um, late uh, 2002. By July 2003, it was gone, and it hasn't been reported really since. 
There was, I think, one laboratory confirmed case in 2004. MERS, MERS had 2,494 um, confirmed cases with uh, 858 deaths and the 34.4% fatality rate. Over one in three people who got it died and it hit 27 countries, although 80% of the cases are reported in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Where do we stand? Well, here we are. Uh, the number that I gave you earlier today was um, actually even lower than the number that I found later when I did this. It's already up to, as of a couple of hours ago, or an hour ago, 950,000 people who have it. And you can read the rest of it, uh, the case fatality rate up to 5.1% in over 200 countries and regions, basically it's in the whole world. Um, here I've just made a graph for you to be able to compare all these different uh, viruses, the R0, which is the reproductive rate, uh, reproduction um, number, sorry. Um, the others are their deaths, the status of them, um, and et cetera. Just, you can check it out on your own. And the comparative measures of these viruses, SARS, MERS, COVID, um, these, these is COVID-19 and the flu. And uh, this particular graph also will give you things like the um, attack rate, which uh, basically means how many people are going to get it based on, uh, as divided by how many people are susceptible. And since these are new viruses, everyone is, is thought of as susceptible. So how are we going to uh, find out confirmed cases? That happens through comparative measures of testing. So the swab that has to go all the way back in your throat or your nasal cavity. Um, very quickly, um, I can just tell you that the tests are easy enough to do. Every major hospital, uh, I'm sorry, every hospital in every first world uh, country has these tests. The problem is that they're centralized and they're slow. Um, this is a, another figure to just let you see how quickly this can be done. This is for the ones who really want to uh, get into it. But the problem is that uh, they're not mobile, and so there isn't much testing going on, or, or for like the U.S., where the CDC didn't follow the recommendations, and then they had problems with their testing or whatever. So really what we need as we move forward is um, to um, – sorry. Really what we need as we move forward is to be able to manage this infection somehow intelligently. So in the absence of, having, absence of having a vaccine, we really need to collect three different types of data. We need to, to have an RNA test that's going to detect the viral RNA after what's called a PCR uh, polymerase chain um, reaction, um, amplification uh, to determine who is active with the infection and who is actively shedding the virus. Yeah? We also have to run serological tests on people who may already have had it and have existent antibodies and therefore, um, you know, are, are maybe not going to get it again. And that's where number three comes. You need to have a study that determines what the rate of, of reinfection may be. What is the reinfection risk? If I've already gotten it, will I be able to get it again? Or will I have antibodies to it? And, and that those antibodies are uh, going to confer um, no risk or low risk for me. When we have these data, we can make intelligent decisions about who to quarantine so that we don't end up having everybody out of the workforce, uh, indoors, socially isolated, which is going to cause economic problems, uh, mental health problems, and so on and so forth. So, you know, okay, I'm just going to skip over this. Right now, as far as vaccines, there's over 44 vaccines that are in development. There are two candidate vaccines already in phase one trials. There are 42 that are in preclinical stages. And just remember the Achilles heel of the SARS. Um, there are ways to disrupt this by, by doing something that will prevent the virus from attaching or um, blocking it in any way, whether it's through various methods. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, I have to speed up and, and get through this, that is going to um, uh, disarm the virus or disrupt the viral envelope or in whatever way uh, keep the virus from being able to uh, proliferate and further infect us. So 
there is this ongoing opinion, as we saw earlier, that uh, if you're not poor, if you're not elderly, if you're not sick, if you're not super young, um, then this disease has nothing to do with you. But if this disease has shown us anything, it's that we are, in fact, not living in a vacuum and that we are really all connected. And what affects one of us affects all of us. And so I hope that we will be very conscious of that as we move forward into our new normal. So that's the talk. I hope I've helped you understand a little bit more of what's going on and why it's important and what's important and how to manage things better. Thank you. Thank you, Roshanak, for that informative presentation. Wow, that was very informative. Um, we would now start our Q&A portion of the webinar. Are you, how are you feeling? Are you up for answering a few questions? Because we have a huge audience and many questions that have come in. And I know that you can also email responses um, to these great questions as well. Are you up for a couple? Or maybe do you, what, what would you like to happen? Um, I could uh, maybe do one or two. I am pretty out of breath, okay. to be honest. I, I bet. Um, and thank you again for doing this. We know that you are doing this while being sick with the coronavirus. Um, okay, <laughs> let me uh, give you give me a, give you a few questions here. Um, how does the viral outbreak end, and does the viral particles eventually just disappear? So um, the viral outbreak did end in the case of the original SARS virus, which was very close to this SARS-CoV-2 virus. They're very, very similar genetically. But that one, remember when we talked about um, management, uh, that what you want to do is to be able to catch this early on. And so in, th in the case of the SARS, uh, the first SARS virus or the SARS virus, um, they were able to isolate um, the patients also because of the severity of the diseases, more patients were also hospitalized. Um, and so they were able to isolate the virus, the people who had it, and in this way, end the transmission. For us, it's not going to happen. The cat's already out of the bag. Um, I feel that absent some kind of intervention, like a vaccine, um, like uh, being able to use... Um, something that will confer um, some kind of anti uh, antibodies to us against SARS-CoV-2 and before it mutates and if that confers low or no risk to us, uh, that unless those things happen, this is going to be endemic like the flu for us. Um, hopefully, we'll develop a virus for it. We have developed a virus for the flu. The flu also has... Um, uh, a reproductive uh, number of 1.3, which is pretty much half of what we have for SARS-CoV-2, and uh, a, about a, a 0.1, and there's some debate about that, um, case fatality rate, um, much, much lower than what we've been seeing. But again, the numbers that we've been seeing for the case fatality rate, I really have to, I didn't get a chance to get into the variables about our variables, and that's really important. Um, so if you have questions about that, please, um, send them to me. Um, the, the, the case fatality rate that we're seeing for sure, for absolute sure, is much, much lower than what is real because it's, uh, it's dependent on the denominator, which is the confirmed cases, and we only have a fraction of the confirmed cases. So many more people have it than we know because of the lack of appropriate testing and because of this asymptomatic or subclinical cases or what have you. So I think it's going to become endemic. It's not going to just peter out on its own. Viruses don't do that. As long as they can get a host, they're going to go. And as long as they can mutate, they will. So we really need to be able to find a way to stop this naturally. I'm sorry, um, with, uh, <laughs> with viruses, I'm sorry, with vaccines or, or so on and so forth, as I mentioned. Thank you, Roshanak. And I just want to remind audience um, that you can click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen if you want to put a question in. Again, we've got about 40 questions. Any questions that are not oh, answered gosh. today, um, they will be um, emailed um, to you directly from the presenter. And Roshanak, I want you to know that many of the audience members have written in and said they hope you feel better. 
Thank you so oh, much. Sure. This is an amazing uh, 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 presentation. So I just want to let you know that oh, you have nice. a lot of big thank fans you. out there. Oh, um, thank you. One it's more really question. Sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> One more question, um, if, if you're up for it. Is there a relation between blood type and the chance of getting the virus? You know, um, I started to read uh, something about that, but there is nothing that's been, that I found that has been confirmed relating to that so far. So that's going to be the quick and dirty answer for that at the moment. I'm just going to leave it at okay. that. Because the problem is that there is so much conjecture and there's so much unknown. This has hit us hard and fast. This is a novel virus. That word novel is really important. It means we don't know. We're guessing. And the reason I gave you so much history about SARS, about MERS, about coronaviruses, about beta coronaviruses, is so that you can see that what we're extrapolating is based on what we've known about uh, the, these viruses and these diseases that are related so far. So we don't know. Um, and we're shooting in the dark. And I don't want to add to the misinformation. The point of giving you this talk was to give you uh, whatever I've given you has been very well researched. I'm a scientist, you know, card-carrying doctor. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to add to the misinformation, the conjecture, and things like that. So. Sure. And, and can you borrow your cover from this? Or uh, someone wrote... I've read that it can cause a permanent damage to lung tissue. That's correct. Um, and that's why I was talking about, that's a great question. I'm glad somebody said that. Um, that's the problem with being asymptomatic and having this um, pneumonia anyway. So what can happen is, and especially for those who end up in the hospital, is if you end up needing oxygen to the point where you're on a ventilator, that ventilator is going to push oxygen, it's going to force oxygen into your lungs, which now has fluid in it as a result of the inflammatory immune response to the virus infection. And so when there's fluid that's going to go in, into your lungs, there's not going to be as much um, gas exchange, right? So we're going to force uh, air in there. And what can happen, remember the, the bottom of your lungs, as it were, are these air sacs that are now fluid filled and these air sacs are where the gas exchange occurs. And when you're, based on, on how much air you're pushing in there, you can pop these and that's it, they're popped. And then you can get fibrosis or scarring of the lung. And the patients who are in the critical, the, the one in five, that 5%, they typically have been on really high, like maxing out the vent machines. So there is very much a chance uh, that this can happen, in particular for those who are on the ventilator machines. But just in general, you know, one has to be careful because uh, you can develop scar tissue from um, these uh, acute respiratory diseases. Thank you, Roshnak. And one final question, and, and then again, all the questions that are not answered today will get answered via email. Um, yeah. Why did the COVID-19 become a pandemic, but the first SARS outbreak didn't? Um, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, okay? This is a conjecture I'm willing to make. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's because of, uh, I can't find our slide. Nope. It's because of what I was saying about um, initial management. Um, it's really important. Nope, that's not it. Um, it's really important to be able to catch these things early on. When China first started to, you know, we started first hearing the rumblings of what was going on, a country like Taiwan started paying attention. God, it's, a, it's a small country, but it managed to really not, um, I'm in the wrong place here, to, to really not have its numbers skyrocket like, like we've seen in America. They responded immediately. And they, they, even uh, in December, were talking with mainland China and finding out what's going on and paying attention to this virus. And then um, by January, they had asked the Chinese, here it is, initial management focus, early recognition, so important. So, and then they sent two people to China to work with the Chinese doctors to figure out what's going on, got the information back, and immediately started testing, this is that immediate isolation, immediately started testing, you know, for anybody who was coming in, they closed down their borders, 
you know, whoever's coming in, do they have a fever? You know, they, they were, you know, for a small country, they did a ton of testing. It's the same thing that South Korea eventually started doing, testing, testing, testing in these and these drive throughs and drive throughs are great because um, you don't go into a room filled with other people that could give you COVID-19 if you don't have it already. It was one of the reasons I was staying out of the hospital. <laughs> it's like, well, I've got this problem. If I don't have coronavirus, I want to get it. Well, you know, there you go. So, um, so when you can isolate it and when you pay attention early, then you can start to take the measures to prevent the spread of it, also depending upon what the, the R0 is. The R0 for SARS is higher than the R0 for SARS-CoV-2. Yes, correctly, you see that we've had this exploding pandemic. So that immediate isolation and taking infection control measures. Um, can you guys see that slide that I just put up? I believe they, yes, they can. Great. So those, those aren't, it's not just like la, 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 la. That really practically means something. So again, going back to Taiwan, Taiwan protected themselves. If you go and look, um, you can see that Taiwan uh, had 30 patients. That was it because they were isolating, they were controlling, they found their first patient right away, patient one. They got them. They, they controlled and they isolated because they can see who that patient came in contact with. That's what was so important early on with this. Who did you come in contact with? What's your history? So we can find those people and we can isolate them. And once you do that, then you keep those people from giving it to other people. And now, as the earlier question was, the virus dies out. It doesn't have a host. It, it, it has nowhere else to go. It's done, right? So in the first SARS, they were able to isolate um, um, and that stopped that one between, uh, I think, what was it? Was it, did I say September or November of 2002 until July of 2003? That was it. But here, the cat is out of the bag. We didn't take China seriously. We thought it was on the other side of the world, you know, especially in the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. And so the pandemic was just like a wildfire that was being fed. This virus had so many yummy hosts to munch on, and it just went from person to person, and there you have it. Thank you so much, Roshanak. And did you have any final comments for the audience before we close today? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, first of all, want you all to always take care. It's really important to take care of yourselves and each other. And as you can see, you know, especially in a world where we have become so much more isolated, uh, where loneliness has become an epidemic, you know, and here we are even more socially isolated, but strangely connecting more, it's wonderful. You know, you have to pay attention to what's going on. We've sort of been lulled and, and been led by the nose by all the events that have been going on and the, the political events and the way that we feel about things because humans are, we like to think we make decisions logically, but we don't. And then, you know, we make bad choices and then, you know, we all end up suffering from it. We're all connected in every way that you can imagine. It's a really small world. We've got to take care of ourselves and each other. We've got to pay attention. So when things are happening, you know, when, when we're being told by, for example, the World Health Organization, flatten the curve, pay attention, isolate, blah, 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 those kinds of things, do pay attention. This isn't a conspiracy. It's real. It's happening. People are dying. And it's not them and not me. It's not us and them. You know, you can get it because you're human. And that's the one thing that we all share. And once you see something like a virus mutate and jump from animals to human as it does, you know, we're even connected to the animals. We're connected to the earth. So, you know, please, everybody, just take care. You know, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And value things. That's all I would say. I mean, Roshanak, thank things, you, items, thank you. Like important things. <laughs> right, right. Thank you again for your time today. And I speak on behalf of everyone. We hope you, you feel better soon. And thank you for this important research. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by Roshanak via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through the end of the year 2020.
LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, be safe, everyone. Bye-bye.